Rice phoned me up and she said, uh, would you like to be the keynote speaker? So I said, oh yes, thank you, and I hung up the phone, and the first thing I thought, oh good grief, what am I going to wear? Uh, <laughs> small problem. You see, nowadays everybody talks about image. And the first thing you say, well, what kind of an image am I going to project to these girls so that they will get the right impression of what a scientist really is? Uh, do I want to tell you that I'm a really serious scientist and that sort of this is the kind of person that I really am? <laughs> uh, you know, I'm a woman, but I am a scientist. I'm serious, and I believe in my field. And uh, I don't think that's going to wash. Besides, uh, I don't really want to feel, does that, that's a little bit more focused. I don't want to give you the idea that all scientists are nerds. <laughs> you have this impression, I know, but it's not true, you know? We're not all nerds. We're pretty decent individuals. Now, the other impression I could have tried to give you is that even though I'm a scientist, I'm still a woman. No <laughs> problems. <laughs> Well, yeah, but, uh, nah, that somehow doesn't wash either, you know? Um, somehow that's not my style. I'm not into glamour. I'm not into all of this stuff. So, okay. So I wore what your generic everyday scientist wears. No, the t-shirt. Uh, and here's your generic everyday scientist. This is sort of the uh, ass end view because uh, they all look the same, male or female. They all wear jeans. They have sneakers. They have uh, papers because everybody's constantly carrying papers. We live by papers. You write papers, you edit papers, you uh, fill out forms, you fill out grant applications. We live by papers. Um, our experimental subjects, I have a friend who had a mouse that lived in his pocket for many years. I won't tell you about that one, but it didn't smell very good. Um, <laughs> this is, we're always busy, which means that this is yesterday's lunch. We never quite had it. The sneakers are, for obvious reasons, we're always late for class, but we make it. Now, the important point, though, on the other hand, is, see this? The ideas. Those we have lots of, and that's the fun stuff. So um, what about ideas? Ideas are kind of funny things. You've got to have them. And they've got to come from somewhere. So stash this little light bulb off into the backs of your minds. And uh, let's look at this generic scientist here. Scientists are generic. Uh, how shall I put this? Well, first of all, it does, science is not something that you are. It's something that you do, just like walking, laughing, eating, sleeping. You also do science which means you don't have to be male or female. You can be either. It doesn't matter. It's something above and beyond being male or female. It's totally, totally what I call genderless. All right, sexless. There you have it. It's beyond that. It's above that. But there's something kind of important. I mean, if, we had, if these ideas and the things that we thought about had gender, right? In other words, the ideas had a maleness or a femaleness to them, then you wouldn't really have you wouldn't be able to process male and female things on computers, for instance. You'd have to have male and female thinking computers, wouldn't you? <laughs> so this is just to prove to you that ideas are not male or female. They're something quite separate. Now, if you have an idea, have you ever heard of this? There's a funny French dude, about 1600 or so, philosopher. This guy, ever hear of him? OK, he's kind of important. He's sort of my, uh, well, someone I believe in, mostly because he said that. I think, therefore I am. Now, the I in there, look at it. Is that a male or female I? Do you know? That I is genderless. It doesn't matter whether you're a man or a woman. If you think, you are. So women, get out there and think. I mean, don't give you know the guys the there they are. They're not the only ones who think. They're not the only ones who do science, right? So I think, therefore I am. This is my motto. This is my life, basically. And uh, seeing as I was sort of doing this research and I looked at this word I, I will quickly show you 
if I can find it, that in fact, in every language that I checked out, the word I is genderless. There are a couple of languages I missed, but every one I checked out. When you say I, you're talking about something above, beyond being male or female. So you and I are thinkers, which is a very, very important, important point. Now, let's go back to that little light bulb business, ideas. If they don't have gender, what do they have? They have something called context. They have to come from somewhere, right? So let's look at some big, major, official, important ideas that had context. You know that one. Everybody knows that one, right? Do you know what this one is? Who's a musician around here? Big idea. Sing it for me. Twinkle, twinkle, little star. It's credited to this guy. Then I left out my little radiation sign here, but radioactivity, big idea. And although everybody knows about DNA being found and discovered and so forth by Watson and Crick, there was a lady called Rosalind Franklin who did all the X-ray crystallography work for it. So in fact, DNA is partly her credit. And then there's this little thing down here called a mitochondrion. These are just sort of my favorite ideas that I'm showing you here. The mitochondrion is a little tiny, what looks like a bacterium that lives in your cells. I know, weird, ugly stuff. But the nice thing about it is that this little bacterium, according to Lynn Margulis' theories, actually landed in cells when they were just little single cells floating around. And they are what gives us the energy to be a multicellular organism. And that's her theory. Another pretty good idea. In fact, an excellent idea. Now, let me just show you some, maybe one more good idea. This is something that one of us could come up with, right? Let's get a hamburger and watch videos. It's a good idea. Why not? It comes from something that you recognize. Now look at this. That's our friend Einstein. <laughs> and this is our friend anybody, one of us. Now, Alfred Einstein could actually come up with the idea of E equals MC squared, right? But he could never come up with the idea of let's watch videos and have a hamburger. Do you know why? He'd never heard of it before. While this girl could probably come up with E equals MC squared eventually, she also knows about the hamburger and the videos. So in fact, to have ideas, you have to have something called context, something called a database. Have you ever worked with databases on a computer? Or information. You can only think about things that you know about. And maybe a few wild permutations here and there. You know, somebody who writes fiction. But you have to have some sort of basic idea to think about. If you can't think about it, how are you going to know that it's there? How are you going to create that? equals mc squared? Or how are you going to create that hamburger and the video? If you'd never heard of it, if you're living in some third world country, are you going to be able to think of hamburgers and videos? Not a chance. So this is the official plug, right? You have to learn. You have to study a certain number of things so that you can then use those ideas and move on. You have to have context. It has to come from somewhere. It doesn't just happen. So you're going to have to study a little bit. Sad part. But look, um, you have to because you need this to survive. Why would you need it to survive? Well, any bit of information that you have around here, you need information so that you can survive every day. You're reading your cereal box in the morning, and it says uh, there's BHD in this, cat in this package. Should I eat this? I mean, is it going to kill me? Is it bad? Why are they putting that in there? Do you know? If you don't have any science, you're gonna, not going to have the foggiest clue whether this is safe or not. Remember this Alar story in apples? How did anybody know that it was nasty? Somebody had to find out. How can you make an intelligent decision if you don't know what it is? You have to learn. You know, there's no output if there's no input. For instance, 
Have a look at these things. You have a choice here. Which one do you uh, put in your mouth and which one do you put under your arms? And which one do you spray on you and which one do you spray on the cat, do you know? <sighs> Anybody want to guess? I'll give you a hint. That one goes under your arm. This one goes on the cat. This one you can eat. It's my daughter's bubble gum. Yuck. And uh, what was this one? Oh, that was sunscreen. You see, you have to know what you're sticking on, you, on yourself, in yourselves, and everything else. This is just basic information. This is chemistry. And it sure helps to know some. Or um, my other favorite subject, statistics. Let's say you've just decided that you're going to buy this awesome car. You go and you check it out in the consumer reviews thing, and it said this is the best car that's ever been built, and you want it. You've saved up your money, and everything's all ready, and you're heading down to the dealers, when along comes your friend. And your friend says, uh, God, my brother bought one of those. It fell to pieces. It's a lemon. Don't buy that thing. What are you going to do? But your reaction is, oh, God, I'm not going to buy one of those. But you are. You should go down and you should still go and buy that car. Because the consumer index is based on statistics. It's based on tests and reviews done on many hundreds of cars, which means that car is a good car. Your bro friend's brother had rotten luck. He got the one car that's statistically not a good one. But chances are all the other ones are good. Go buy the car. This is statistics. So when people talk about statistics on the TV and they say, OK, 60% said this, and 30% had fewer cavities, do you know what they're talking about? You've got to do a bit of math. It really helps. So it's very important. Now, if you are thinking about doing math and science, the other reason you really should be doing this is because it really empowers you to deal with your future. I have to apologize at this point, because uh, the future you guys are going to have to deal with, the future that we left you, and it's a mess. I'm not too proud of that. But uh, you've got the environment to deal with. You've got politics to deal with. All of these things that we did to you. And boy, you'd better have the firepower to deal with it. And you're going to have to make intelligent, critical decisions. Because I and my generation left you a mess. So say thank you. but. Uh, I think probably the most important part is that I really should help you get yourselves out of that mess if I possibly can. And that's part of the reason I'm here. So all of those nasty things that we have left you, well, here's, a, here's your chance to learn and to do something about it. And if you are going to do something about it, what kind of jobs are you going to get and what, what are you going to do? Well, let me show you some really interesting stats about women working. I'll give you a few seconds to read this yourselves. Read it and weep. Why don't you tell me that it's out of focus? Now you don't have to wreck your eyes, and you can still read it. Better? OK, I'll go through it. First of all, women in BC are 44% of the labor force. What percent are they of the BC engineering force? <coughs> Only 5%. What was the average annual salary offered to a student with a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering? Hey, those dudes make over $30,000 a year. Not bad. However, what was the average annual salary offered to a student with a bachelor of degree, bachelor's degree in psychology? which is what a lot of women tend to, to take. 19,000, a lot less. OK, so huh, what's the percentage of women in the secretarial positions in BC? Well, guess it, 99%. Everybody's a secretary. So there's the 1% of the guys out there, right? And then in 19, between 1975 and 88, the male labor force in BC increased by 25%. During that time, the female labor force increased by 64%. What does this say to you? There are more women out there working, right? 
Now, you can't all fight for those secretarial positions, can you? Then, women were 98% of the dental hygienists and this kind of technicians and assistants. What percent were they of dentists? Only 2%. I mean, that's a disgrace. <laughs> in 1970, women in BC earned 57 cents to the dollar. What are they earning? What now? Many years later? What, 20 years later? They're earning 67 cents to a male dollar. That's not much, right? Now, if hairdressing and cooking trades are excluded, what percent of apprentices in BC are female? 3%. Not very good. So in 1971, the census said that most women are secretaries, bookkeepers, and clerks. What are they now? Secretaries, bookkeepers, and clerks. Real nice. So we haven't, you know when it says on TV, you've come a long way, baby? Not so. In fact, the other sad thing is that the high paying jobs usually involve development, financing, engineering, marketing and operating new technology. This is where the action is going to be when you guys get out of school and university. So those are the jobs you're going to have to go for. Why are, why are you targeting low paying jobs? There's no point. You might as well target the high paying jobs which are in those areas. Now, healthcare is a growth, growth area. That's something that I am particularly fond of and that's an area that I work in. Um, high-tech firms are going to be in. So there are all these jobs out there that are going to be geared to people who are skilled. Megatrends 2000, which is a book that maybe you should have a look at, says that there are going to be more women working. Almost 100% of women are going to be working in the next 20 years by 2000. And there's going to be a need for skilled labor. In other words, people who know what they're doing and they're not just expecting to do some sort of menial job. If you want to do a menial job, you can go into the service industries. On the other hand, if you're planning to use your head, which I hope most of you are, then you might as well go into something, for instance, into the technologies, high tech and that kind of thing. Because in the future, again, according to Megatrends 2000, Work is going to be something that goes on in people's heads. People are going to be paid for what they know, not the number of widgets they have managed to turn out, out on the assembly line. Okay, so what you have and what you learn is in here, and you take that with you wherever you go. The upside of that is, hey, have knowledge, will travel. You can go anywhere. If it's in your head, you can move from place to place. You can travel the world over and there are going to be people who will use your head. Go for it. There's nothing wrong with that. Now, on the other hand, if you are going to do this, and you're heading for science, it's a wonderful vocation. But before you get there, yep, there is high school, and you're going to have to do math, and you're going to have to do science. And it's a terrible thing, and everybody goes, oh, God, I don't want to do math. I hate it. I don't want to do science. It's awful. Uh, before you do anything else, make a distinction. If you hate teachers, go away. Don't listen to me for this. Uh, if you hate your science teacher, don't, uh, don't say, I hate science. Say, I hate my science teacher, OK? And if you hate math, though it's not you, that you hate math. Maybe you hate your math teacher, OK? So make a distinction. Don't destroy something just because you don't like your teacher. It's happened. It happened to me. So if, and again, teachers, go away for a minute. Um, this is something I sort of have to say to you just as I talk to you. Um, when you're in school and when you're heading for university, you're paying good money for this. Get your money's worth, guys. This is important, really important. If you want the teaching that you're going to get is as good as you make it, ask questions. Don't sit there and be a miserable lump and go home and say, I'm never going to get this. Go to your teacher and say, I'm never going to get this if you don't help me right now. OK? It's your prerogative. You're going to have to ask for this. Um, the other thing is, a college, you have contact with your teachers. Your teachers know you. If you hit a big university, you're a face in a thousand. If you don't go up to your prof and say, hi, I'm Mary Smith, and I need help, and I'd like to talk to you about what I'm doing, he's never going to know you from the doorpost. 
Okay, so you have to make yourselves known. This is something that you have to do to get what you want, which is an education. Studying is not enough. You're going to have to make that little extra effort, and you're going to have to talk to your teachers. And believe me, they're going to thank you for it. It's so nice to know that there is a face beside that number, and that Mary Smith is, in fact, a really neat girl. And in fact, Mary Smith has a lot of ambition, and I'm going to do everything for her. And I'll tell you another sneaky truth, which most people don't admit to, but um, I know I do it. If I know the student, and I know that student is working hard and is making every effort and comes and talks to me, if that student is making a 49% and needs a 50 to pass, you, she's gonna, I'm going to find that 1% somewhere. On the other hand, if Mary Smith you know, is late coming to class, leaves early, and never says boo, and wishes to God I were dead, which also happens every so often, well, guess what? It's going to stay at 49. <laughs> and it makes a difference. So if truth be known, please go talk to your profs, talk to your teachers, and make learning an interactive process. It's very important for you. Not for me, but for you. Now, let's say you are heading for science, and you're... Um, going to get there. How do you get there? Well, there's a little something called motivation. Very, very important. You have to want it. And that has to come from you. I can't make you motivated. I can't say, look, this is what you've got to do. You must go out there and be a scientist. It's wonderful. Um, that'll last maybe till lunchtime. So it's got to come from you. Now, what motivates you is totally individual. It can be Hey, I want to go out there and make a lot of money. Or I want to go and do something that I'm really going to enjoy. Or I want to do something that um, gives me flex time. Or there are all sorts of choices. Or you can do it the way I did, which is I fell into it backwards. You know? uh, my grandmother says that I really had a real bent for botany when I started. I destroyed her garden with the <laughs> garden shears. After the reprisals to that, um, I switched over to ballet real fast, let me tell you. I was going to be a ballerina, sure as shooting. I was going to try it for the National Ballet Company, and they're always doing my ballet things, and it was really great. And then my mother decided that uh, no way she's going to be a ballerina. So the day came for the big tryouts. Uh, she made sure that I was in the back row with all the klutzes. I didn't make it. Of course, retroactively, I think she was probably right, but <laughs> oh well. So there it was. So after that, mother decided to take things in hand because ballet was just not the thing for me. She said, dear, why don't you take all these fine arts classes? So motivation being what it is, I said, oh, yes, mommy, I will. And I signed up for every science class in school right away. After that, it turned out that science was kind of fun. I hated to admit this, but it really was fun. Uh, in fact, it was dead easy. It was, in fact, it was like skiing. The more I did, the easier it got. You know, in the beginning, it looked a little tough, but then it just got to be more and more fun. So there I was. Mother was in desperate straits. That made me feel real good. You see what kind of motivation I had? Anyway, um, that was good. So I went on to science. I went to university. Yeah, mom was still pushing fine arts, so I went straight into science at UBC. Finished that. Uh, more motivation. I was aiming real high. I was going to be a lab tech, at which point, um, there was this boyfriend involved. That's another sad story. Uh, yeah, well, consequently, I decided, well, hell with you, mate. And I decided, I'm going to go do a PhD. I'm getting out of town, which is what I did. And there I was. I applied to every place in the book, ended up doing a PhD in England. I was really stuck. But boy, was it fun. I've never had so much fun in my life. So uh, this is how I ended up doing what I'm doing. Total serious motivation for science, right? Once you're there, it's fantastic fun. You get to do whatever you want. All you get to do is ask questions all day. You know, like the inquirer for inquiring minds? It's trying to instead of trying to figure out which soap queen is dating who and what's going on, I figure out which hormone or which whatever is sticking to what receptor. Same kind of thinking pattern. Why not, you know? Just as much fun. In fact, probably more fun. And guess what? I get paid for it, which is a lot more than you get if you just read the inquirer. So, uh, <laughs> It's really great because you do it all day and then you go home and at the end of the month somebody hands you a paycheck and says, you've had fun all month, here, have some money too. So it's really a good thing. 
<laughs> and the other thing is, if you've probably been told the last little while that you're going to change careers at least three, five times during your life, take science. If you're lazy like me, the career changes with you. You don't have to bother changing. It'll do it for you. You can do, uh, you do a lot of accounting as a scientist. You do writing. You, have, you can be creative, whatever you want. And when you do science, the best thing is the asking questions part. So if you go to university and you're in your fourth year, by that time, you should be doing your own experiments. And experimentation is something that I particularly like, because all you have to do is uh, look what something is doing and then throw a monkey wrench into it and say, hey, now what happens? So really easy stuff. I will show you what I work on just for about five seconds. What do I you know, spend my time with all month and get my paycheck for, right? All right. What are these funny looking things? Well, the lab I work in works on blood clotting. Ooh, I know, gross. But it really is neat. Just imagine if your blood didn't clot, right? So it's really important. This little critter up here is something called a platelet or a thrombocyte. And there's little granules in it. And normally it's a nice little round fellow and it doesn't have a nucleus. It's just a little bit of a cell. And it sits there. However, if some, something scratches you, make a hole in yourself somewhere, this little guy goes nuts. It develops all these arms and legs, and it stretches out. And the moment it develops arms and legs, it grabs other platelets, which are also developing arms and legs. And you end up with something like this, which is a platelet aggregate, which clumps on exactly where the hole is made and plugs it. You know the little Dutch boy with the finger in the dike? Same deal, exactly. There it is. They plug it up. And boy, am I glad that they do. Otherwise, you know, we'd all bleed to death occasionally. <coughs> so this is what we work on. Now, my pet story is I want to know how this platelet here knows to tell the other platelet, hey, Joe, let's get over there. There's a hole there. In other words, the message is passing between these platelets. And the messages live in these little granules. Well, one platelet is tickled or activated. It releases what's in its little granules. And that those little things are chemical messages that go to the next platelet. It says, hey, Joe, get over here, fast. And my particular interest is trying to find out what can inhibit messages going between platelets. Because in some situations, especially in hospitals and in clinical situations, have you heard of thrombosis? OK, somebody has a plug in one of their blood vessels. Um, one would like to be able to stop these messages so that you don't get random plugs happening. And so one of the little toys that I play with is a little protein that has a way of inhibiting platelets. This is actual real science stuff. What this says here, I play with something called C3A. This is a little funny protein. Normally, if you tickle a platelet, it calls its friends and it aggregates. And we look at it with a little machine called an aggregometer. And what you can see is here there's an even distribution of platelets. And as they clump together, light can go between them. And we measure light transmission. So in a normal situation, which is PBS is called a buffer, it's just the soup these guys live in. Normally, this is what the platelets do. You tickle them, and they all clump together. And then you just see a difference in their behavior. But if you put some of this mixture this sort of inhibitory protein in, then these guys can't clump as well. In other words, their messages aren't getting through. Similarly, here it tells you how much of the little message granules, in other words, these ones down here, get dumped. In a normal situation, lots of message granules get sent. If we put in our inhibitor, not many messages get through. So it just plugs up the system. I mean, is that easy or what? If I can do it, you can do it. I mean, that's straightforward, right? You don't need to know much. You do need to know a little bit about platelets. You need to know about, a little bit about chemistry, a little bit about biochemistry, and there you are. You can start asking questions, and then you learn as you go along. Every day, you ask another question. You go dig in the library, and you read, and then you find out more. So in fact, I didn't come, you know, land here in a parachute, and I knew everything under the sun, and I will never have to learn another thing. I'm going to learn till the day I die. Sad. But it's also a lot of fun. I mean, I don't know how to tell you this, but I really have fun every day. 
Is that, that's not supposed to be, a, that's not a serious kind of statement, is it? But I don't know, I can't, can't really be very serious about it because I really do have a lot of fun. Rumor has it that I go whooping and dancing around the lab as if I were crazy. So do the other people. We enjoy what we do. And to sort of get to the bottom line in all this, if you think that science is dry, boring, colorless, it doesn't have anything in it, let me just show you some vaguely scientific pictures. I hope they show up. We may have to darken this. Various little colorful things. Science has creativity, first of all. The only thing you really, you can create. It's like recipes. You can cook. Everything we do has a recipe. So if you can cook, you're made to be a scientist. Every biochemist I know is an excellent cook. Some of them are cordon bleu cooks. Okay, so if you can cook, if you can create recipes, go for it. That's the place to be. Or if you're into the money and you're interested in finance, this isn't finance, this is just another wonderful scientific picture. Is there a way of dimming the lights, do you know? Anyway, I'm just trying to show you these nice colored pictures as we go along here. This is a semiconductor and it wants some sort of photographic. There, that's kind of pretty. Just to show you that science is not all white and dull and horrible. So, a little bit more of just beautiful pictures. This is something that, these are brain cells. Again, not that boring, is it? Not that ugly, either. Uh, if anybody is interested in geology, here comes one for you. I can separate these. This is a section through a, a stone, a particular kind of stone. So, and those of you who have a biology bent, like me, why do these things get sticky? These are some more cells, but s cells have little cables to hold them. And these are, this shows up the cables in the cells. There is so much beauty in science. You, I cannot tell you. Everything you look at has its own beauty. And this is just yet another example. It also has, well, besides beauty, if you're into technology, you get to play with the nicest widgets with bells and whistles and computers and whatever. It's all yours. Everything you can imagine that you can do in life, science probably has it in one form or another. So if I can sway you at all, the official plug is do math, do science. Go on with it because the best thing in, in life is definitely it. And I think to just get to my very last slide down here, I, will clo I think you've probably had enough of me trying to convince you. So these are some tin crystals that you might want to see. And I'd just like to remind you of one thing. I think, therefore I am.